Hello, my name is Tom McDade. I'm a biological anthropologist at Northwestern University just outside of Chicago in the United States. In, on November 9th, 1989, I was living in Athens, Greece as a um, college student doing a study abroad program. And on that day, there was a lot of shouting and hooting and hollering and pounding pots and pans out in the streets. So I went outside to figure out what was going on. And that was the day that I learned that the wall had come down. Well, as a kid, I was always interested in science. But um, to be honest, what I really wanted to be was a professional baseball player. Um, but I couldn't make the team in high school, and so then I focused on uh, my studies and um, became a scientist. So I guess um, that initial dream came true. For the past 20 years, I've been striving to break down the wall between the life sciences and the social sciences to advance our understanding of human biology and health. Most of what we know about the human body, how it develops, how it functions, and malfunctions, it's actually based on research with mice and rats in the lab or with select groups of people who are willing to come into the clinic, um, usually in affluent industrialized countries. But humans have inhabited and continue to inhabit an incredibly wide range of ecosystems all around the world. We also live a very long time. It takes a long time for us to develop into fully functioning adults from infancy through childhood and adolescence. So as a result, the environments that we live in have a really big impact on our bodies and on our health. So in short, human biology is best conceptualized as a contextualized biology. It is a social biology. Where we live, how we live, who we live with, all have direct uh, and profound effects on the wiring of our brains, the expression of our genes, the production of hormones, immune factors, other key aspects of our physiology. But here's the problem. When our studies of human biology are limited to clinic-based settings, we have a very limited view of the experiences and environments that actually shape our bodies, their function, and our health. So for me, a central challenge has been the development of methodological tools that allow me to collect biological samples across a wide range of naturalistic settings in the field and outside of the clinic and the lab. Now, much of this work has used dried blood spots or drops of whole blood collected from a simple finger stick and placed on filter paper. These are the papers that I routinely use. Um, here, this is just ink for illustrative purposes, but once you nick the finger with a lancet, you put a few drops of blood on the paper. The paper dries the blood and preserves it. We fold it up and it's easy to store and we can ship it in the regular mail. So what this allows me to do is basically get a blood sample from just about anyone anywhere in the world with very low cost and burden. And then in the lab, I optimize assays that can measure a wide range of biomarkers with a high level of precision and accuracy pretty much the same level of precision and accuracy that we could get with a venous, more traditional venous blood sample. So this method for me, this approach is essential for allowing me to break down the wall between the lab and the field. And with it, I've been able to document how stress affects immune function among adolescents in Samoa in the South Pacific. I've been able to look at how ethnobotanical knowledge among parents protects child health in the Amazon basin of Bolivia. I've looked at how poverty leaves a lasting signature on the epigenome of young adults in the Philippines. And I've looked at how social stratification and discrimination all increase levels of chronic inflammation um, across a wide range of, range of settings in the United States. For all of these questions, the um, methodological developments that allow me to um, break down that, that barrier between the lab and the field are essential for answering these kinds of questions. In mid-March, we were locked down due to COVID-19. It was a scary time. Um, but I quickly realized that my work could help us understand how the virus was spreading in the community. And I got spe special permission to get back into my lab on campus. And I set to work developing a method for quantifying SARS-CoV IgG antibodies in dry blood spot samples. Now, antibodies and te antibody testing is important because it allows us to look back in time to see who's been exposed to the virus, even in the absence of symptoms or clinical diagnosis. Now, during the first wave, of the pandemic, antibody testing was limited primarily to hospital settings, which were overwhelmed, overwhelmed with clinical caseloads, and to the rollout of these cartridge-based tests, um, which were qualitative only and also subject to high rates of false negative and false positive results. The test I developed is highly sensitive and specific, and most importantly, it addressed a critical need. How do we collect blood from people during a pandemic when our healthcare system is overwhelmed and we're telling people to, to, to stay safe at home? Um, well, 
With the method I developed, we can send collection materials out to research participants who collect their own blood from the comfort and safety of their home. They send them back to us in the mail, and there in the lab, we can quantify antibody levels with a very high level of precision. So we've integrated this um, collection protocol into a no contact research platform where participants fill out survey um, asking for information about their environments, their experiences, their symptoms, their behaviors, all again in the comfort and safety of their home, um, which we then can look at as factors that might predict the likelihood of exposure and seroconversion with our antibody test result. Now at this point, we've analyzed samples for more than a thousand people across Chicago. We have an ongoing study with a national sample of college students in the US, and we're also testing healthcare workers in Tanzania and Ghana. Now, so far, our essential new findings are twofold. The first is that the platform works. People can send us blood samples from their home. We can analyze them in the lab and document the factors that promote and prevent the spread of coronavirus in the community. The second finding is this. Levels of community transmission are higher than most people think, with a lot of people being exposed and not ever knowing it because they don't develop any symptoms. Because our assay is so sensitive and because we can test large numbers of people in the community, our data suggests that the seroprevalence of prior exposure right now could be as high as 20%. And because we can easily and safely sample multiple people in the same household from the same family, we found that 70% of people who share a home with a confirmed positive case of COVID-19 themselves become seropositive for IgG antibodies, even if they don't have symptoms. And most of them, in fact, don't experience or report any symptoms. So this finding is important implications for herd immunity, and it also suggests that exposure in the home might generate some protection against future infection. I think society benefits when we break down the wall between the life sciences and the social sciences um, because it allows us to promote a more comprehensive and complex understanding of health. When we talk about health in the life sciences, we tend to privilege forces inside the body the expression of our genes, patterns of neural activity, production of hormones and the like. When we talk about health in the social sciences, we tend to focus on factors outside the body, socioeconomic status, the neighborhoods we live in, the quality of relationships with friends and family. But this is a false dichotomy. If we consider the interplay between forces inside and outside the body, we'll be in a better position to improve health all around the world. And for me, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a jarring reminder of just how important this is. The virus that causes COVID-19 spreads through social contact in the community, where it's having devastating social and economic impacts. Yet our understanding of the virus is based almost exclusively on the study of the sickest people in hospitals. If we frame COVID-19 as both a biological and a social problem, and apply methods that allow us to study in the clinic and the community, we'll be in much, we'll be a much better position to effectively deal with the pandemic and the impact it's having on our health as well as society more broadly. At this point, we've endured two waves of infection, and antibody tests are providing important information on seroprevalence and the factors that promote and prevent viral spread that we can use to prevent future um, outbreaks. Um, but these tests don't tell us much about the development of immunity, and we don't know what will happen as winter approaches and flu season kicks into high gear and we're all stuck inside and can't socialize outside safely. This is a situation that's keeping me awake at night, but it's also the situation that's motivating me to push forward with a finger stick dry blood spot uh, method for quantifying neutralizing antibodies. 